Hi, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, where we're going to be taking a look at uh, the Network Plus certification, or we're going to be taking a look at just an aspect of the Network Plus certification. So I'll share my screen now. All right. So this is the topic that we're going to be taking a look at today uh, on this webinar comparing technologies that support cloud and virtualization. Uh, so first of all, uh, a little introduction about me. My name is Kazim Adebuega. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. I'm also a Microsoft MVP. Um, I've been doing this for a little over 16 years now, and I work here at the Lasso CBT Team Limited. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, using my Twitter and do Kazim can teach. Right, so next, let's take a look at our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start things with introduction to CompTIA Network Plus. Uh, next, we'll look at introduction to virtualization. And we'll also be looking at hypervisor. You know, what does an hypervisor mean? What does it do? Uh, we'll also look at introduction to cloud computing for those who are new to cloud computing. And we'll get to compare what the difference is between virtualization and cloud computing. And uh, we'll wrap things up with a demo where I'm going to be showing you how you can create and manage virtual machine with an hypervisor, how you can create virtual machine uh, leveraging virtualization, that is with a physical system with an hypervisor that we can see, and also how to do the same in the cloud, uh, on the Azure cloud specifically. So let's begin with introduction to CompTIA and Network Plus. So first, who is CompTIA? Uh, CompTIA is an organization responsible for organizing and sponsoring uh, this vendor neutral certification exams, right? Vendor neutral certification exams such as the A plus, the network plus, the server plus, the project plus. You know, all those exams that you see end with plus is being organized by CompTIA. So, and uh, CompTIA is not uh, particular about uh, proprietary concepts. Uh, for instance, uh, when you do a Cisco training, uh, Cisco is more interested in teaching you about how to use, how to configure their own products. That's the Cisco routers, the Cisco switches, you get the picture. But when you do the network plus, for instance, the CompTIA network plus, um, instead of learning about proprietary concepts, CompTIA is more particular about general networking concepts that all the networks share. So the knowledge that you're going to learn from Network Plus should be applicable uh, when you find yourself in a Cisco environment, let's say. When you are within uh, a Microsoft environment, those, net, those uh, knowledge should still be applicable, right? So that's uh, CompTIA. And uh, for the CompTIA Network Plus uh, in question, the CompTIA Network Plus validates your knowledge on networking skills. So it ensures that you have what it takes uh, to call yourself a network technician, right? And uh, so if you would like to uh, look up the objectives that mix up the CompTIA Network Plus, uh, then, then you can uh, simply do a Google search and ask what is Network Plus. So you should be able to see links uh, giving you, uh, you should be able to see links to uh, the objectives that makes up the CompTIA uh, Network Plus. So next, introduction to virtualization. So what is virtualization? Let's start with that. So virtualization is when you use a physical machine's hardware to run multiple VMs, that is multiple virtual machines. Um, 
An example that I can give here will be if you have a Mac computer and uh, you want to also have a feel, you want to have a taste of what Windows operating system looks like. So th there are two options, there are two choices that you have here. One option will be for you to buy a Windows laptop. Another option will be for you to virtualize, right? Uh, so, so you see virtualizing means that we're using the same physical system and that we have some program installed on it that allows us to now install other operating system of our choice on that physical system. And that when you're virtualizing, uh, you're using out of the physical resources that you have. That is, you're using from the resources of that physical system. Uh, for instance, the CPU storage, RAM, that you are going to be assigning to the virtual machines that you are going to be creating will need to be from the physical system. And you cannot use more than what you have on the physical system, right? So that resources allocated cannot exceed what you have available on the physical hardware, right? So you might be wondering, what, what then uh, are some of the benefits to virtualization, to doing virtualization? Uh, one of them is better use of our hardware resources. Uh, statistics has even shown that most of the time we don't get to use above 15 to 20 percent of the resources that we have on our system, right? So uh, we're better able to use more of the resources that we have when we virtualize, right? Um, recovery is also faster, right? So I can choose to, uh, for instance, back up my virtual machine and if disaster happens, if a crash, for instance, happens, I'm able to easily recover from the backup. You know, uh, I probably might have, a, might have copied the VM to an external hard drive. I can, I can simply bring it back from the external hard drive, right? So recovery is faster that way. And uh, if you run multiple servers or you run multiple data centers, so it's possible for you to migrate or for you to move the VMs that you have on one system or in one data center to another. Or it might even be via some form of uh, redundancy, some form of fail over uh, techniques that you've already set up, right? So next, what is an hypervisor? With an hypervisor, it helps us manage and run uh, one or more virtual machine on a computer. So there are two types of hypervisors. There is the type one hypervisor and the type two hypervisor. The type one hypervisor is also known as native or bare metal hypervisor. And this type of hypervisor is installed directly on the server, on the system itself. And a very good example of this would be the very popular Hyper-V or VMware vSphere, right? And for the type two, also known as the hosted hypervisor, uh, this one is installed on the host operating system. And then you can run your VM from there. So th there's a difference, right? The, the, the first one, the first uh, type one hypervisor, that one on the bare metal, meaning when you create a VM, uh, you, you're communicating directly uh, on the bare metal. So the VM gets created on the hypervisor itself. Whereas for the type two hypervisor, you have it installed on the host operating system. So meaning the VM sits on top of uh, the host operating system rather than uh, just uh, taking up, rather than sitting directly on the hypervisor itself. So there's another layer to it here. And a very good example uh, will be uh, the Oracle Virtual Box, or if you use a Mac, there is the parallel uh, for Mac. Let's, let's take a look at uh, introduction to cloud computing. Um, cloud computing is no longer uh, new, so I believe some of us uh, should have learnt a word or two already or should know a word or two already about cloud computing. 
But for the benefit of those uh, who are new to cloud computing, uh, cloud computing is that platform that allows people use online services. And uh, these services are available across different devices. So that's the cool thing about cloud computing, you know, but you need to do so now over the internet, right? So it's possible for you to also set up your own cloud. So if you have, uh, let's call it an Hyper-V server, and that you make available resources on your Hyper-V server where people are now connecting to it via the internet, then you can as well call that a cloud, right? So, so that's what a cloud is in a nutshell. It equals virtualization plus internet, right? So what are some of the benefits of cloud computing? Some of the benefits of cloud computing uh, includes no upfront costs, right? Uh, for instance, um, if I need to set up uh, a server, I need to set up, the, for instance, if I need to set up a service in the cloud, an email service, let's say. So I'm not required to purchase a server or a software to do that, right? So all I need to do is pay my cloud provider and I can start to consume at the services. So there's no upfront cost are required in that regard, right? And uh, you know, you simply pay for resources that you need. Uh, so it's a very good example of that will be uh, the, the PHCN electricity. You know, now what we have now is the use of the card meter. So you see that uh, when you no longer have credit on your card meter, then you simply don't have electricity. So likewise, the cloud, right? So you pay as you use, you pay as you go, you know, so to speak. And um, the, the, the last advantage uh, there is speed. So with cloud computing, you are easily able to spin up resource, resources really fast. So if you're looking to create um, three virtual machines, you can create those three virtual machines in no time at all, right? So, so that's the, the speed, you know, the agility that you have up there in the cloud. And uh, popular examples of cloud providers include Microsoft, AWS, Rock Center, and the likes, right? So, uh, for instance, Microsoft will use Microsoft Azure to render cloud services to the public. Let's, let's take a look at the difference between virtualization and the cloud. Uh, sometimes people often ask, what's the difference between virtualization and the cloud? Well, virtualization is a part of cloud computing, but the difference is this. When you virtualize, people or you know, your users, the customers will need to interact with the hypervisor to create their VMs or to manage their VMs. So you need to have your server, you know, install uh, the VMware VSphere on the auto, you install Hyper-V on it, and then you can interact with your VMs that way. But when we talk about the cloud, um, the, the people or the customers don't need to interface directly with the hypervisor. So what the cloud providers have done is that they built APIs, you know, they, you know, to automate the entire process. So this way, the user or the customers are able to do things on their own. You know, they're able to do things via those interfaces or portal, if you like to call them that, and that they've made available. So that's really what uh, the difference is between, um, between virtualization and uh, the cloud. So next is the demo. So in this demo, I'm just gonna be walking you through how you set up uh, how you set up virtualization, right, on a physical system that I have with me. So I'll show you on the Windows system how you can set up Hyper-V. And once the Hyper-V is set up, you know, the Hyper-V becomes the hypervisor and how you can use the hypervisor now to create your VMs and manage your VMs. So I'll show you that. And we'll also look at how to, uh, create and manage VMs also in the cloud. So the example that I'm going to be working you through 
uh, with that of the cloud would be Microsoft, would be on Microsoft Azure. All right, so that, that's the IP address, right? I, I've just, I'm trying to connect to another machine. The reason I'm connecting to another machine is because um, the machine that I am uh, currently presenting from, let me see again, okay, either the IP address is not correct or the system is not connected. So just give me a moment. Uh, the, the system that I'm using presently uh, doesn't support virtualization. You see, it doesn't support virtualization. So I can't use this one. Um, I'm trying to connect to another system that does support a virtualization. Uh, so um, I want to check, you know, we talked about hypervisor. This is a Windows 10 system, by the way, right? So Windows 10 also supports Hyper-V. So you necessarily don't need to have a server. Uh, to to uh, work with Hyper-V, even though, yes, there are um, a lot more that you can do when you use Hyper-V on the server as opposed to using it on a client system such as Windows 10 or Windows 11. But let's see how to install this hypervisor that we're talking about. You know, this is a Windows system. That means it's going to be Hyper-V. So I'm going to go to my control panel. We all know how to access the control panel, but this is more like a shortcut, right? So to access the control panel, we'll just come to start and we look up control panel. But this is where I'm coming to. So from control panel, you want to go to your I'm looking for programs programs uh, yes programs and features so it's right here so I'll click on programs and features and from here you can see there is a link to turn windows features on or off so I'll click on that and um, so if I look through I should be able to see hyper-v so you see so this is hyper-v is already turned on is already turned on Right. So if it's not turned on already, so I'll just check this box. So once I check the box and I click on OK, it will try to install the hypervisor for us. So the hypervisor is not installed on the OS. No, in this case, it's not. Right. So it communicates directly with the bare metal, with the bare metal directly. So that's how the hypervisor works when you are using uh, Hyper-V or you're using VMware DSPF. Right, so that's how it works. But the one that uh, runs on top of the operating system is uh, tools like VirtualBox. Um, we also have VMware Workstation. So I can download VM VMware Workstation and then install it on the operating system. But in this case, no, this is just communicating directly with bare metal. So if I need to launch Hyper-V now, I'll just go to start and I can search for Hyper-V. You see, this is the Hyper-V manager. From Hyper-V, I can see I have a system here. So if I want, I can create my VMs, create a virtual machine. And uh, when you're creating a virtual machine, it just walks you through, through the process. So it's a very intuitive process. Just next, next to finish, right? So you give your virtual machine a name. Uh, let's call it uh, Server 1, let's say, or PC 1, Server 1. Um, is it a generation one, generation two? Today's session is not about generation one, generation two, but, but just quickly, uh, generation one VM um, uh, has some, um, it, it has, generation two has some additional features that generation one doesn't have. For instance, how much uh, of CPU uh, that you can use, how much of hard drive capacity that you want to use, you get the picture, things such as uh, hot swapping. For instance, when I have a generation two VM, I can have the memory to read on the fly. Imagine I have a system running and I'm adding memory to it without, without shutting down the VM. You know, normally the, 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 what we're used to is that when you have a system running and you want to add memory, you need to shut it down first, put the memory and then bring it back up. 
But in the case of a generation two VM, you don't need to do that. So you can just increase the memory and you're good to go. You can have hard drive, you can expand the hard drive. So those are some of the benefits that generation two VM provides that generation one doesn't have. So here I get to allocate its memory. So you see, I can't go beyond the physical memory that I have on the system. On this system, I have about 16 gig of memory, right? So I cannot use more than 16 gig. I need to use less than that amount of memory. So next, I need to configure networking. The reason I need to configure networking is because it's a VM, right? So it's not going to be running in isolation. The reason I'm spinning up the VM is so that people can consume the services that I'm going to be having running on that VM. So how are they going to connect to it if the VM is not connected itself, right? So this connection allows people to connect to the VM. So I can then say, oh, I have virtual switches defined. Please connect to this virtual switch. This virtual switch is connected to this aspect of my network. So it really can get very complex. But the whole idea is to provide connectivity to the VM, right? So you do so. And next, you want to also give it an hard drive. You can't run the VM, you can't run the system without an hard drive, right? So it's asking you how do you, you know, what's the geometry? What's the size of the hard drive? So you can size it as appropriate. And then how do you want to put operating system? Which operating system do you want this VM to have? You know, this is a Windows system. Like if I want, I can install a Linux operating system, Ubuntu Linux, for instance, on this system as a VM. If I want, I can install a Windows Server. If I like, I can install a Windows 11. You get the picture. So you install an operating system of your choice, uh, either the operating system, you have it in the form of an ISO image, or you have it in the form, uh, you have it on a DVD drive. So just pick, pick your option and um, you can hit the finish button and uh, you go through the process of setting up the system. So if I want to set up the system now, just on the system, so see, let me double click so that you can see what I'm talking about. I will. Connect and you see I can start the VM, power the VM, stop the VM. I can pause the VM. I can create a snapshot. You get the picture. So I can do a lot of awesome stops here, right? So this is just uh, trying to whet your appetite a little about how VM is created. So we're virtualizing now. What I'm doing now is virtualization. <clears throat> On the other hand, if what I wish to do is uh, to, let me think of, <coughs> is to leverage on cloud computing. Um, so I, I guess you can still see my screen. I've just launched a web browser. Can you see that as well? Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay, okay. So let me use Azure as an example. Say I want to consume Microsoft Cloud offerings. Microsoft Cloud offerings. There will be this question that you need to ask yourself or that you can leave your IT team to help you come up with. You know, the question will be, oh, now we want to do cloud. We need to put pen to paper to see if going cloud is going to be cheaper for us, that's of staying on premises, right? Those servers, like the server I showed you earlier, you know, we can use that to virtualize and still stay on prem. But you know, when you stay on prem and the business is continuing to grow, or you're running an environment that is a little big, you need to have multiple servers. You need to make sure that you power the servers, right? What happens if people need to work? You have customers that need to work after close of work. So that means the generator has to be running 247 during weekend, the servers will need to be available. So if you looked at the math and then you think that, wow, you know, this is a lot of cost for us. How about we consider doing cloud? The question will now be, what kind of services do we need to have? Do we want to have in the cloud? Or which of the services do we need to migrate to the cloud? Because for some people, it might be too much of cost to migrate everything to the cloud, then that's where the whole idea, the whole concept of hybrid, you know, hybrid 
uh, environment comes in, where you're choosing to keep some on-prem and you're moving some of your core services to the cloud. So you see, you're still marrying, there's still a marriage between the two. You didn't move everything, you move some to the cloud and still retain some on-premises, right? So you ask, what do we want to move to the cloud? Well, maybe we'll say, oh, what is critical for us right now is email. We need people to be able to do email. We need people to be able to do meetings. So that means we need teams. You get the picture and uh, maybe we we'll also need uh, what else might be important. Uh, we also need to have a document management system. That means you need SharePoint. So in that case, uh, you can say, maybe we should go for Microsoft 365. Maybe we should go for Office 365. You get the picture. That's a SaaS service. Um, sorry, maybe we can try to have a webinar to talk about that one another time. So I don't digress. I'll just stay with the VM that we want to create. When we want to create VM in the cloud, we call that one an IaaS service. That's infrastructure as a service. You know, when you create a VM, you own the VM. The difference between virtualizing with your own server and virtualizing in the cloud is that your server, you can see it. You are in charge of powering it. You are in charge of cooling it. But when you move to the cloud, you don't see the server, but you can connect to it and you can do everything else. You can power it down. You can install whatever tool that you want on the system. So I'll just give an example. We are almost out of time. So I'll just give an example. And the example I'm going to be using will be that of Microsoft, Azure. So if not, we would have also seen like AWS, how it's done on AWS platform as well. So for Azure, I'm going to log in by typing portal.azure.com. Portal.azure.com. And uh, once I type that in, it's going to prompt me for a login, right? I've logged in in the past. So um, it took my login, and uh, you know, I have this system to myself. So uh, it, it's not very good, though, but uh, you know, there's also this concept of passwordless now, you know, for you to be saving your passwords. Uh, but we're not, not talking security now. So you can see I've logged into my Azure portal now. Remember what we said about virtualization versus cloud. When I virtualize, you see that I was able to have access to my Hyper-V. That means hypervisor, I have access to it. I'm doing things, creating VM, managing the VM via my hypervisor. But now I'm doing cloud. I don't have access to my hypervisor. But what? Microsoft, in this case, gave me access to is a portal. So via this portal, I can do the things that I want to do. So I believe with that, it should make sense. You should be able to connect the dots or to be able to differentiate between virtualization and cloud. So you see here we have, if I come here now, I can say I want to check out my resource groups. If you need us to pick up another webinar on this, uh, maybe a later time you can just go ahead and say so. So you see, I can create, start creating workloads from here. If what I want to do is, let's say, create a virtual machine, I need a virtual machine. I'll just come here to virtual machine. You can see these are some virtual machines that I have on an account, one of my accounts. These are some three virtual machines that I have. So if I need to create a VM, I'll just click on create a VM, right? So via this portal interface, I can create my VM. So it's just going to ask me a few questions, right? Uh, where do I want my VM to reside? Uh, which subscription? Because I have multiple subscriptions, right? So I can choose my subscription of choice. I can choose my resource group. Resource group is just a component that you use to group your resources, your workloads on Azure together. So it's easier for you to discard of them at a later time. It's usually easier for you to see them all in one place, right? So it is that container that you can use. So you give your virtual machine a name, right? So after giving it a name, you can also specify your region. It is best for us to stay with region that is closest to us so we don't pay more. So when you don't stay with region that is closest to you, you get to pay a little bit more, right? 
And there's availability option, you know, there in the cloud is not free. So you have to be careful with picking up your options in the cloud. So he's asking, he's telling you that there is also the concept of high availability in the cloud, but if you don't want to have availability, no problem. But things can go wrong also in the cloud. That means you will not be covered. You are responsible for taking your backups. But if things go wrong and you don't have availability set up, then sorry, right? But if the service you're setting up is mission critical, then you want to ensure that you have some a uh, level of availability in place. So maybe I want to configure availability zone, availability set. If you need this, we can talk about it some other time. Image, that is what operating system do you want this VM to run? Is it Windows Server 2019? Is it Windows 10? Is it SUSE Linux that you want to run on it? Do you want to run Ubuntu Linux? You get the picture. So you just choose an image of your, of your choice. And somebody was asking earlier about size. How do I pick CPU? How do I pick memory? You guessed it. So here is the place. So I can choose a size that makes sense for me. So if I feel, oh, this one is two virtual CPUs. It has seven gig of memory. But with this, I'm going to be paying $194 per month. Maybe this one, it looks too much. I want to step it down to this one. What I'm doing is not really resource intensive. You get the picture. So this is how you get to pick your sizes. So size is made up of uh, the, the CPU, the memory, you get the picture. So it gives you a size. Then you give it a username because when you have a VM, you connect to it. You connect to a system by its, its username and the password, you see? So you can give it a username and uh, let me give it one because and my password, I'll choose a password for myself. Choose a password. And uh, okay, uh, my password isn't strong enough, so it's telling me that. So let me do something a bit strong. You see, next I can proceed, proceed to disk next. You don't, you can't have a VM without a disk, without storage. So it's asking you, what type of storage do you want? Do you want SSD storage? Or are you looking to use uh, the regular old HDD? You know, so it's your choice. Uh, the specification would determine which of them to go for. SSD, you are going to pay more. Uh, there, there's something you know, I told you about the Azure pricing calculator. Perhaps is the first tool that you want to use to get your pricing right, to know that the thing fits your budget. Then you just start picking and choosing, right? So do you want encryption? If you want encryption, there's cool security up there in the cloud. Next part is networking. So there's also networking even right there in the cloud. So you can make it connect even to your on-prem servers. So it's possible, you know, when you do the networking right. So management, you choose management. And next, let me click on that. So management is talking about things like diagnostics. You know, so diagnosis, do you want to enable diagnostics? Uh, do you want uh, to do some uh, sort of Azure AD login? You get the picture, you know, how about a backup? Do you want to enable backup? So those are some of the buttons that you need to click. Once you do this, there, there are things, there are settings that you can still get to later after the VM has been created. But at the creation point, at the creation time of the VM, you can also set those options, right? And um, so you can do other things like tagging. And uh, when you tag, if there's a need to tag, you tag as appropriate and uh, you can choose to now create your VM. So you can see, so once I hit create the VM, uh, in less than about 15 minutes, I'm going to have this VM uh, be created for me. So creating a VM uh, up in the cloud uh, is really very easy. It's complaining about an error. So let's see where the error is, you know, what the problem is. Uh, it's saying, okay, the virtual machine doesn't have a name. So maybe I want to call it PC123, right? Uh, Uh, 
of the password is still there. All right, so you get the picture. So he's able to figure things out. He went through the, and uh, he saw that everything looks okay. Validation check passed successfully. Now, if I want, I can go ahead and create my VM. I'm going to be paying about this price per hour for this VM site. So you get the picture now. So this is my little demo uh, for you for today's session. So I think we're a little bit over time. So thank you very much uh, for joining this webinar. Uh, so if you find it useful, please uh, be kind enough to uh, look up our YouTube page, right? So we have a page up on YouTube. So it's Lasso CBT18. And you can follow our social media pages as well. So it's Lasso CBT18 across the different social media uh, channels. So on Twitter is Lasso CBT18, on Instagram, Lasso CBT18, on LinkedIn, so Lasso CBT18, and uh, on uh, YouTube as well. And we have a, a number of educative content uh, even up on YouTube. And uh, if you see a need for us to roll out another free webinar, you know, to touch on uh, some other technology gray areas for you, uh, that is going to be about 30 minutes, one hour, you know, long, we're happy to do so. So on that note, uh, we'll just uh, tell you to wrap here today. Thank you very much. And, uh, let's do this again another time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.